Good morning, everyone. My name is Scott Hamilton. Welcome to our session on the science of executive decision making in a virtual world. Uh, Going to get started here for just a moment. Want to give you, give you, want to kind of give you a quick overview of a couple of things here. Um, first of all, if we get our slideshow going here. Uh, I'm coming to you from the University of California, Irvine, Beale Applied Innovation Center, or the, or the host organization. I want to kind of give you a little background here on what, uh, what we're all about. First, this session today, we're going to be looking in an interactive way at the science of executive decision making. You've got a feature on Zoom where you can ask questions. Feel free during the course of this session to um, give us your questions at any point, um, and we will address everything today. We're going to make this extremely interactive. Also, there's a private chat feature. Feel free to use that as well. So either Q&A or chat feature can reach all of us. All right. Um, a little bit about Executive Next Practice Institute. Um, over 65,000 people have attended our in-person um, live sessions and our virtual sessions over the years, almost 400 of those. Uh, our whole organization is very unique in that we look at emerging trends and new value creation frontiers. That is, what is really going to propel your business or your organization forward? We look at this philosophy of creating what we call next practices, and that'll be true today. What we're trying to do is come up with ways to move your, your organization forward. Also look at potential development and investment opportunities and potential strategic alliances. So on the, among the viewers today are viewers international, um, Mexico, Canada, Europe, uh, as well as domestic, uh, heavy concentrations in Southern California, our home base, of course, uh, but uh, a good showing of people from across, across the nation. Here's our registration link for future events, and I'll get to that in just a minute. Here's our value proposition of being a part of this organization uh, as a member or a guest, but certainly a regular part of us. Um, first, it's this value proposition of connecting with the C-suite. We um, have all industry sectors represented, life science, hospitality, engineering, construction, you name it, they are all part of this, primarily because we know that the best ideas often come from industries outside our own sector. Secondly, these are relevant and timely information for decision makers. So we encourage you to get your entire executive team part of these events. It's very high quality content. We've got two outstanding contributors today, and I know you'll get a lot of value from what they've got to say. And then finally, as I mentioned earlier, um, our membership and our network is global, small to mid to large cap companies. Again, uh, because each size company can learn from each other. The larger enterprises can learn from emerging concepts and the emerging companies can certainly benefit from being part of a larger enterprise. Uh, just a quick note, next week, uh, right after Memorial Day, uh, we've got a returning champion, John uh, Russman, who's going to talk about how to think like Amazon. And we're excited about this session. John was a major uh, leader in their whole marketplace um, endeavors. And so we look forward to hearing it from John at 11 o'clock on um, the 26th. Now, stay connected with us. Bookmark these links, please. Our next sessions are coming up like May 26th. Um, these are again, either interviews or major summits. We have a TV channel where these sessions are recorded like this one today. And then finally, join as an annual member. Joining as an annual member gets you into our live events, which will be returning soon. And that covers you through 2021. All right, here's where we're at today. We're all linked by this disaster of COVID-19. Um, all of us are impacted, whether we are in the healthcare system or outside of it. Um, there are impacts coming at us from adjacent industries and remote industries. Here's what our CEO membership is saying right now. First of all, and they were saying some of this before COVID-19, by the way, um, burn rate is first and foremost. They are concerned about preserving capital, preserving resources so they can survive uh, the next few months and years. Secondly, they want a culture that can transform and be adaptable and have agility. Third, uh, customers. The customer base is changing. The buying preferences are changing. The buying patterns are changing. 
So they're very concerned about maintaining a, a sense of customer centricity and tapping the collective intelligence and touch of their employees, their workforce, to make sure they know how the customers are feeling. Um, all right, let's get to our session today. Again, we welcome these two outstanding um, thought leaders. Armand Pajad is a frequent speaker on brain science, team performance, and leadership. Teaches a course on team leadership coaching uh, at Texas A&M. Uh, he's had over 15 years of consulting and advisory experience with top institution Fortune 500 organizations. I think I met Armand through one of these Fortune 500 uh, organizations in the past, and he does fantastic work. Um, uh, as you see, he's got a very impressive academic and um, professional background. He currently serves as a board advisory member to the University of California here of uh, continuing education, um, and it's helping them dramatically improve the relevance and quality of their academic programs here at UCI. So we welcome Marmon. And Ken, um, Dr. Brousseau specializes in behavioral assessment systems for purposes of management selection, performance management, career advisement, and executive team coaching. Uh, Ken's been the author of a number of articles on career development, work uh, system design, team development, organizational design that have appeared in Harvard Business Journal, Harvard Business Review, rather, uh, Journal of Applied Psychology, Organization Behavior, and Human Performance. Um, over the past 30 years, of course, Ken has consulted for a variety of large organizations like NASA, ARCO, uh, ABB, et cetera, FAA, Johnson & Johnson. Um, and uh, he's received his uh, PhD in organizational behavior from Yale. Uh, he was on the faculty of the management organization department at Marshall School of Business uh, at USC. He's a member of the American Psychological Association and the American Association for Advancement of Science. So as you can see, we've got two terrific leaders with us today. Um, with that, I'm going to stop my share and we're going to bring in um, Armand Pajad. Armand, welcome, this, welcome to the show this morning. Glad to have both of you. Wonderful. And, and I'm going to uh, make you the host here and Turn it over to you. Wonderful. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to kick it off. Uh, this is Ken Brusso speaking. Uh, as Scott already mentioned, that uh, we've published our work in a number of journals, and I wanted to bring up this particular one in the Harvard Business Review that we published some years ago for the a couple of reasons. Uh, it was a culmination of a great number of a, a lot of research over a number of decades with executives and managers all up and down the corporate ladder. As far as we know, it was probably the largest study of its kind ever published anywhere. We looked at over 120,000 executives and we had a lot of information on them. We were able to determine who among them were the most successful and the least successful. We learned a great deal uh, from that particular study, and we're going to share some of the insights from that. Uh, the, the fact of the matter is that uh, everything we're going to talk about today comes out of those decades of experience that Armin and I have uh, uh, a cumulative uh, experience with. We've been working together and working with teams and their leaders for the last 10 years. So we've got some particular insights we want to share with you uh, from that experience. I wanted to begin with just a little bit of a personal story here of why I got particularly interested in this uh, business of decision making. Uh, one of my first stops in my career was as a young assistant professor at the University of Southern California. And I, when I arrived there, I was pretty sure I was, you know, was a pretty smart guy. I had a PhD. I had studied at an Ivy League university. Uh, but I had this little niggling doubt in the back of my mind. You know, Ken, if you're so doggone smart, how come you're so doggone slow? And by that I mean I had noticed all along the way that oftentimes uh, colleagues, coworkers, and particularly in graduate school, they would get an idea real fast and maybe running down the road with it and dealing with it. And I'd still be sitting there thinking about it. So what is this? What's going on? So that was still kind of in the back of my mind when I arrived at the University of Southern California, USC, where I met my 
uh, colleague, Mike Driver, who actually created this model we're going to be talking about. And after just a few minutes with Mike Driver one morning when I, I, I arrived there, I had a Eureka experience. What he told me about this matter of decision-making styles uh, informed me that what I was noticing about being slow really had nothing much at all to do with intelligence. Simply, it, the case was that compared to a lot of other people who made quick decisions, would reach conclusions very rapidly, I tend to drill down deeper and look more broadly. So that takes more time. It's not a matter of intelligence. It's a matter of how one uses whatever intelligence they happen to have. And that's what we're going to talk about a lot here this morning. Okay. The, uh, the particular topic is decision-making uh, in the time of this pandemic. Um, but it's built upon a great deal of work, as I've mentioned, with leaders and their teams. And one of the things that we have seen is that most teams do not use their decision-making time effectively. Uh, the, the interactions that take place in team meetings often get derailed and decisions seem to get made, but maybe they're not really made or they get derailed later on. So the, uh, the work we've done with leaders in our teams and the research we've done tends to indicate to us that oftentimes the decisions that teams make, uh, there's a false appearance of buy-in and commitment when in fact none may actually exist at all. So what we have put our shoulders into in recent years has been helping leaders assure that their teams are making genuine decisions with full buy-in that actually get executed. So this is a, a very important matter, this business of decision-making, in that most C-suite executives in their surveys, they indicate that they spend at least 70% of their time making decisions. My experience is, is that it goes even beyond that even when they don't think they're making decisions, they're mulling things over in the back of their mind. However, a majority of those executives say that their decision-making time is not used effectively. So, the, uh, uh, the, for um, the average organization, uh, there's a great deal of time and inefficiency in the decision-making processes. It means lost working time, uh, hundreds of millions of dollars in wasted labor every year. So moving to this topic of virtual teams, everything I just said about decision-making in teams is made much more difficult in the context of decision-making in teams. I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, uh, Armin here will take it away from this point. Yeah, thank you so much, Ken. Um, all the issues that Ken just talked about are become more pronounced when executives make decisions in an online environment. You know, the type of decisions that executives typically make uh, kind of are in two categories, broad categories. They're either big strategic decisions or they're decisions that cut across multiple disciplines, functions, and business units. And those decisions, by definition, require a higher level of uh, inter inter interaction, alignment, and, co and coordination between multiple stakeholders that are, in fact, very hard to achieve in a virtual environment. Uh, Ken and I have noticed uh, four common themes or patterns uh, over the last decade. And, and uh, we see some executive teams that uh, executive team members appear to be going along with the decision, uh, but in fact, they lack full commitment. More so, we're noticing polarization among team, team, team members, even though after uh, a lengthy amount of deliberation discussions, the differences between team, team members seem to escalate. Uh, more so, we're also noticing some um, issues with power distance and uh, and you know issues with um, you know executives and team members not um, disagreeing with the CEOs. 
Uh, more so, we are seeing a lot of decisions, uh, even at the executive level, not being executed. So there's a lack of follow, follow through. As uh, Scott mentioned, Ken and I have been uh, tackling this challenge with decision making um, of, of the last decade. And, and the essential question that we started asking yourself, asking, asking ourselves even way before the COVID was that how, how do we enhance the capacity of executive teams and virtual teams to make genuine high quality decisions uh, while having a high level of agreement? And I know some of you are experiencing uh, your own specific team challenges, uh, but for now we want you to consider the, the following three uh, team scenarios and kind of think through how you might address these team challenges. Uh, the first team, we call them the agreeables. Uh, th these are the C-level team of a European food company. And uh, interestingly, you might uh, observe that the team is very agreeable, they're very cordial in face-to-face -face meetings. However, you're surprised by the fact that a few of those decisions are acted, acted upon and decisions are revisited over and over. The second case, we're calling them the debate society. You're gonna notice a lot of arguments in this team. And you're startled by the fact that when you meet with them privately, there is, they, they tend to be more open-minded open, open, open -minded and agreeable. And the third scenario, scenario, we call them the indecisive. In this team, by the way, this is a mid-sized insurance organization that we work with. And you see that there's a lot of uh, discussion and del deliberation happening in this team, but you're amazed that uh, they don't actually arrive at any decisions. So you can kind of think about your assumption about what's going on with this teams. You can use a chat function and, and, um, and, and, and tell us what you think uh, is going on with these teams. So, so the main focus that of our conversation, this is kind of what, what, you, what, you, what, are, what we want you to take away is that most teams have a blind spot. There's a slight but very important uh, psychological phenomena that's happening with team decision making and that, that, that we're going to be sharing with you in a few minutes. Uh, so Ken and I are noticing uh, three challenges that, uh, that teams are uh, facing. Uh, there, there's a limitation with video conferencing. Uh, there are individual differences in how team members process information and make decisions. And Ken is going to be talking about that in a few minutes. And thirdly, teams have a major blind spot. There's a stark difference between how they make decisions publicly versus how they make decisions privately. Let's tackle the limitation in technology. As all of you are aware, we're using uh, video conferencing systems more and more often, but unfortunately, as far as we know, none of these systems create the natural interactions that humans need to make quality decisions. Uh, these video systems introduce additional co cognitive loads, which make, make it very hard for us to pick up on nonverbal signals that we need for effective decision making. We know from research from neuroimaging as well as EEG that uh, the brain waves of problem solvers and decision making uh, makers sync over time. And that's very hard to do. Um, you know, if, even if there's a 1.2 second lag in, in uh, video conferencing capabilities, we may perceive others as less attentive or friendly. There's a, a issue that we call gaze awareness that is a direction of our attention, which is very hard to uh, track in a video conferencing environment and that make, uh, make it more difficult for us to read facial expression. And more so, you guys might have heard of this, uh, Zoom is becoming a household name, very much like Google. Uh, so there's a phenomenon now called Zoom fatigue, uh, which basically uh, the, the fact that the constant gaze makes us feel very uncomfortable and tired. So a lot of uh, people are, are reporting exhaustion after um, uh, you know, participating in long Zoom meetings. Uh, 
So I'm going to turn it over to my friend uh, Ken to tell you about the differences in styles of thinking and decision making. Ken? Okay, thanks, Armin. Yeah, the, uh, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we've looked at teams a, long, a lot longer than there have been virtual teams. Let's put it, just put it that way. And one of the things we've seen all along the way, and this has not stopped at all, if anything, it's become more and more of an issue, is the fact that in teams, the, the team members have different styles of thinking and deciding. And those, you know, I'll just give you some examples. Some of the team members are really quick to decide. They've just taken a few facts and bang, they've made a decision. Whereas other styles are more analytic and take a lot of, in a lot of information and a longer time to make decisions. Some styles focus on a particular uh, outcome, goal, or objective that they have in mind when they're making a decision. When they find a path to achieve that goal or outcome, they're going to stick with it. They're not going to swerve. Whereas others will have multiple goals, not just one in mind when they're making decisions. And consequently, there is no one path that's going to achieve all those goals and objectives and therefore their decisions they make are multi-pronged and they may shift and change over time. So these are the, some of the key differences that we find in teams. This is the model that we use for assessing and understanding how people think and decide. We use this when we're working with teams. The whole team will typically go through an assessment, including the team leader, and it's not that any one person is gonna fit precisely in any one of these boxes here. You've all seen two by twos like this before, I'm sure. This has some unique features that I'll talk about as we go along. So just looking at this, uh, a two by two table on the horizontal axis, left to right, the two styles on the uh, left side of this matrix, decisive and flexible, flexible styles are action oriented, they're fast and make decisions quickly. On the right, we have this, uh, styles we call maximizing styles. They're going to want to maximize their intake of information before they're going to be ready to pull the trigger and make a decision. On the top row, we have two styles, decisive and hierarchic, hierarchic that are going to be very focused in their thinking. They're going to zero in on a particular objective, and they're going to look for a path to achieve that one particular objective. Whereas other styles on the bottom, the flexible and integrative styles are what we call multi-focused styles. And they're gonna have multiple goals and objectives in mind. And as I mentioned before, those goals and objectives and even their strategies to achieve them can morph and change over time as the situation changes. So those, those two styles are much more variable. Now the question is what happens when people with these different styles get into a team meeting? whether it's around a conference table or via a Zoom meeting. So uh, the decisives, uh, they're going to be putting their effort and energy in trying to make a decision quickly and move things on. They're going to be trying to close down the discussion and get on with things. The flexibles are going to want to make a decision quickly, but they're going to also want to change their direction just as quickly if they see a change. So they like to keep a lot of options on the table. No decisions actually ever really close. Uh, the hierarchics, well, their propensity is to drill down deep into the details, think things through very carefully, find the best path to go forward that's going to achieve that particular objective they have in mind. The integratives, well, they're going to drill down too, but they're going to also think broadly. They'll have a lot of criteria and goals and objectives in mind. So they're going to be trying to open things up. The decisive are going to try to be closed down. And you can imagine the kind of chaos that, well, you don't have to imagine it. I'm sure you've seen it. This is stuff that happens every single day when teams get together. So what we prescribe for team leaders especially is to keep the team coordinated and in the same phase of decision-making at the same time by making it very explicit which stage we're in. So stage one is what we call discovery of facts and pertinent information. That's just surfacing the information about the circumstance of the situation at hand that we're, we're going to make a decision about. Phase two is an exploration of alternatives and choices. Now, I want to point out that these aren't necessarily just one, two, three in that particular order. You can go back and forth between phase one and phase two, but it's incumbent on the team leader to make it clear 
that which of these phases we're in at a particular point in time. So at some point, phase three, we're going to start looking for perhaps, depending on the issue, new and creative solutions that might be a little bit outside the dotted lines. And then ultimately, we're going to want to develop a plan, a strategy to execute a particular decision. So those are the four phases. It's important to keep them all aligned and understood. Now, as uh, Armin suggested, and one of the unique aspects of this model and assessment tool for this, uh, looking at styles of decision-making and thinking is that if you do the assessment, as we, we're going to invite you to do it for free, you get two profiles of your decision-making styles, not just one. This is very unique. So what we're driving at here is one of those profiles is going to show you what we call your public face, how you make decisions, how in fact you see yourself when you're thinking about how you're making decisions. That's kind of the public face of your style. However, there's a private style that most of us aren't really aware of. It comes out when we're by ourselves scratching our head, making a decision, or maybe working with some uh, couple of close colleagues we really know very well. So the the, the upshot of this for team decision-making is that what we see in the research says is that the decisions that are made in public situations are made when people are in this public face of their profile. However, they may make a decision, they go back to their workstation or their office, and they're by themselves working or maybe with a couple of other close colleagues, and they may see things very differently at that point in time. These differences can be very dramatic. Uh, I, we've got a database here of nearly half a million people we've assessed worldwide. And I can assure you when we do statistical correlations between the public styles that people have and their private styles, we find no correlation. What does that mean? It means that most of us think dramatically differently when we're in our private mode as opposed to our public mode and most of us, because when we're in our private mode, we're not watching ourselves. We're not even necessarily aware of that. Okay, so back to the virtual world of online meetings. What are some of the key characteristics? Um, Armin already mapped out some of them. First of all, they tend to be rather formal. It's a structure. I mean, you may be looking at a panel of a lot of faces, or it may be one face at a time, but everyone's right there. And there tends to be single speakers. These things are not duplex. You know, there can't, two people can't be talking at the same time. One will drown out the other. So that cuts down the interaction opportunities. Dialogue is very difficult. Uh, it's difficult to read other people's reactions. There's that lag that, that Armin talked about. Uh, we're looking for nonverbal cues. These are often very difficult to perceive in, in virtual meetings. So, and virtual, furthermore, some of these people have never really met each other face to face. I've, we've got a client, they've got 49 locations around the globe, and some of their teams actually span Asia, the Americas, and Europe. And some of those people have never and probably never will meet each other. So they're not really familiar with anything other than the face they see on camera. So these features tend to keep us all in our public styles. So, consequently, uh, Armin, I'm going to turn it over to you in a minute here. I just want to make some comments about the risks here. And the risks that uh, exist, and this is true even out of the virtual world, is that the decisions that are made by the team in a team meeting, formal, whatnot, may simply not be real meetings. People may seem to agree in the team meeting, but they're likely to be in their public styles and they may be nodding their heads and smiling. But all that may indicate is that they're listening and they're not actually signaling that they're agreement. Other people may think they've agreed, but in fact, they may not actually have agreed. And then they go back to their offices, they revert to their private operating styles, and then they're likely to see whatever the issue was very differently. And maybe they carried ideas into that meeting that they never really voiced. So this all can create a false sense of buy-in and consensus when none actually exists. Result, you've all seen it, 
poor follow through. The execution of decisions is faulty if it occurs even at all. And that results in frustration, wasted time, effort and expenses. Most team members view their teams as really inefficient. We need them. We need teams. We can't do what we do these days. The products that we have are too complex to do them without teams. But these are some of the issues. And so we're going to share some ideas about what you do with them. So once again, uh, here are the three scenarios that Armin mentioned before, the agreeables. In a moment, we're going to show you some data from these, these three firms, the agreeables, the European Food Company, and so forth. This is the agreeables. So this is a typical chart we look at for the whole team in this case. We just counted up the what we call the primary styles, styles people are in most often. Yeah. And the public styles are in front. We call them public role styles. The uh, private operating styles, which come through in the assessment, are in the back row. They're the red bars. So in public, we see this big spike. You see it here in this flexible category. What that means is what I've already said about this team. They're very congenial. They're open. They're agreeable. They seem to make decisions, but then they go back to their offices. And what happens? Well, now they've got to think things through. You can see those hierarchic and integrated bars are being elevated like that. That means they don't make decisions on the spot. They've got to think things through before they're going to be convinced and feel honest making a decision. So consequently, many, many decisions simply never got made. And it was a big frustration for everyone on the team. Uh, the CEO was really difficult to deal with because he was a bit chaotic in his thinking. And the consequence was that he got fired. So it was an outcome that no one really wanted to see, but that was the outcome. The next case is a high technology, a one of the largest distributors of high technology uh, components uh, in, in the world, actually. And in front, again, we have the public role styles and frequency. So you can see that big hierarchic spike there. Uh, and consequently, we tended to call this the debate society because whenever an issue got on the table, boy, they had to really think about it and not just think about it, argue about it, and debate even tiny little details. So they, they seldom would actually ever seem to close on a decision. Decisions never quite got closed. But if you were to go meet with these people one-on-one -on -one or in small groups, you'd find that they were very open and collaborative when they were in their private uh, operating styles. So ultimately, over time, they began to know that about themselves. And most of the decisions they would take would involve small groups of people. And uh, this uh, decision, would, a consensus would kind of float up out of that. And then they'd take it to the public forum and, and make the decision. The next is that uh, insurance company. Armin, why don't you take it from here? Yeah, thank you so much, Ken. So this was a really interesting case. As you can see at the blue bars, there's a big diversity of decision styles between these team members. Uh, so in public, um, they talked a lot. They shared a lot of information. Oftentimes, uh, they got out of phase with each other. In, and in public, they would be very proud of the fact that they get in, involved and engage in lengthy conversation. When, but when you met with them privately, they, ex, they would express extreme frustration and uh, with, with the fact that their meetings are merely ineffective. And they spend a lot of time uh, talking about issues over and over again. So it took about six to nine months uh, to, to get the team members aligned and coordinated. And uh, we taught them how to engage with each other effectively on a one-on-one -on -one basis and triads before uh, reaching a decision at the team level. Um, so it was a very interesting case. So we at the end of our presentation, we, we have some uh, uh, tactics or strategy and strategy for you guys to consider uh, our first recommendation for you is that when you are involved in team meetings, know your individual team members. Look out for two dimension. There, there may be a group, uh, uh, team members that are pushing for action 
and there may be others who are pulling to do more analysis and are asking for information. Also be on the lookout for members who want to converge on one single solution versus others who want to diverge and look at multiple options. As Ken was saying, uh, mind and be aware of your team's blind spot and how they're behaving privately versus publicly. If there are two agreeable in, in a meeting and in privately they are expressing disagree disagreement and frust frust frustration with the decision, just account for that uh, and be mindful of that dimension. Uh, what we recommend is that do not treat important team decisions as a one-shot event. What do we mean by that? That is, we recommend that you, see, that you separate delib deliberation and discussion from actual decision-making. Uh, you have the option of uh, priming, with what psychologists call priming, uh, your team members by sharing and circulating questions in advance of a meeting. You can uh, ask your team members what's new or different about a decision you're, they're about to make. Um, and an uh, option you have after your team meetings, you can share, uh, send a follow-up emails and ask your team members to vote on, on options rather than doing it all at once. The second recommendation that we have is that engage in parallel information processing with your team members. And here's why. A lot of teams, and you guys probably have, have had the same experience, talk about what everybody already knows, but they dismiss the critical information that one or a few team members have access to. So what you want to do as a team leader to, is to surface, to create opportunities and conditions where that critical information gets talked about. Uh, you can um, uh, use anonymous polling or voting uh, uh, systems like a phone-based uh, system that's offered by polling everywhere. Uh, a, a lot of teams like Ken, Ken, Ken and I are using digital collab collaboration tools like Miro and, uh, and Miro uh, that uh, allow for anonymous voting and uh, information sharing. Next, we, we want you to, even, even after you reach a team level decision, we, we want you to uh, do a follow up and meet with some of your team members or even meet with them one on one to assure they're buying, you know, check with them again about their understanding about the issues and be on the lookout for any concerns that they might have. We did talk about the fact that a lot of decisions, even at the executive level, don't get executed. Um, and so treat a decision as a live object and uh, make sure that you're, as Ken was saying, that you're honoring the, the different phases that are involved in a decision-making process. We, we live in an interconnected world. Uh, so a lot of us are working not only with teams, but with the, net, in the network of teams. So look at the consequence of your de decision and the impact that it has on the rest of the organization. Um, so as Scott was saying, uh, Ken and I are, are uh, wanna, we want to create a movement. We, we want to empower decision makers everywhere. We want all of you to make better decisions. Uh, so that's why we're making this wonderful assessment available to you for free. Um, you can easily log in to the website that's been posted here and use the code INTEGRO. And we invite you and all of your team members to uh, take advantage of this opportunity. More so, uh, we have additional videos uh, that we have on the website. You can learn more about decision making and uh, decision making at the team level, the science of decision making, the history of decision making, how to make yourself more adaptable when it comes to decision making. If you have any questions, email us. We would love to hear from you. Now I'm going to turn it over to Scott. Um, yep. Yeah, that's great. Uh, uh, Ken Arman, uh, terrific job. Uh, let's take some Q&A from the audience. Again, for the audience, please uh, uh, shoot some questions at us. Uh, we've got a couple already I want to address uh, to Ken and Armin. Uh, first of all, 
You touched on the fact that um, one of the limitations of a virtual decision-making environment is we're also missing the spontaneity, spontaneous uh, uh, interactions that happen, the kind of serendipitous um, interactions that can create uh, new ideas. So we're no longer walking down the hall or having an aside conversation in a meeting that might spark and create something new. How, do you, how are you addressing that? How do you recommend teams address this uh, inability to kind of get to those informal collisions that produce often some great ideas? Well, that's a good question, Scott. Uh, basically, uh, you have to kind of invent informal collisions. Uh, you can use these the Zoom technologies, all these video conferencing technologies for one-on-one -on -one, just as much as you can for uh, teams. And so if I'm a team leader, I encourage people to talk to each other uh, fairly frequently. And uh, I, you know, if they're reluctant to do it, I'll suggest some side conversations they can have so that by the time they get together as a team, they, a lot of those ideas have surfaced because as you point out, they can be critically important ideas. Now that's a great comment. Uh, again, kind of creating those situations as if we're in a live environment. Uh, question for our viewers. Um, what about millennial style versus baby boomers? What are the generational dis differences that you've seen? You have any thoughts about that, Armin? I'll take a shot at it. Yeah, I think, you know, um, the millennials obviously are, are more savvy. I mean, I'm making a very, I'm making a general generalization here, but, um, as it relates to virtual environments, we, we kind of seeing both of them, um, being challenged when it comes to decision-making just because of the facts that we talked about. I mean, um, the fact is just, it's becoming more difficult to, um, to have a natural inter interaction given the te technologies that we have available to us. Yeah, I would say that the, uh, the millennials are going to be uh, more comfortable with this virtual technology than certainly the baby boomers are. But I wouldn't count us baby boomers out. We, we can still learn, uh, but the, it's going to come a lot easier to the millennials. So I put them to work making sure this technology works easily and seamlessly for all of us. Yeah, I think that's a great, uh, great uh, role um, in, in knowing who's comfort, establishing who's comfortable with this virtual environment. We have another question, a great question here. Um, it says, the recommendations that you have seem to bypass the issue of time. Some decisions must be made quickly. And again, that goes back to what we talked about earlier. The building is on fire right now. Uh, CEOs are concerned about burn rate. A lot of these decisions have to be made on a day-to-day -day basis. How do you address that in terms of speed of decision-making? Okay, well, that's, that's, uh, that's an important issue anytime. You, well, first of all, it's going to be incumbent on the team leader to discern what kind of decision is this. In fact, is there a short fuse burning? Is the fire building burning down? If it is, well, we got to make a decision as quickly. And you don't convene a bunch of people, 15, 14 people online. You're going to keep maybe it down to the very minimum of people to make a decision quickly. If it's a big decision, well, then you need to have a number of different meetings with different people, as we're suggesting, not just one big team meeting. I see organizations over and over making the big mistake of getting a room or uh, a uh, computer screen full of 15 to 20 people thinking they're going to make a decision. They're not going to make any decision at all. Any decision they make won't be a real decision. If you want to make a real decision, a particularly an important decision of any magnitude, you're going to have to have eight or fewer people in the decision-making session. No, that's a great point. Um, and also, what about this idea, another question from a viewer, what about the regions of the world uh, taking into account um, not only geography, but different time zones, um, uh, but also the cultural implications uh, in terms of how people make decisions? What, what has been your experience there? Well, the time, asynchrony of time around the world is a big issue. You can't get everyone together in any meeting at, any, at one uh, point in time when you got people in Asia all the way over to, to Europe and with the Americas in the middle. 
So is it going to mean smaller meetings with particular groups of people? It's going to be important on a team leader to make sure all of that gets integrated with key people. That's number one. What was the other part of that, Scott? There was another answer. Well, there, the real question they had, too, was um, uh, this idea about culture, the role of culture, yeah. um, culture and language. Yeah. Fortunately, the assessments we've done here have been done with well over a million people worldwide. So we know there are cultural differences. Uh, the, the way people, particularly they come out and how people present themselves in public. So, for example, in Asia, it's really difficult to get a highly interactive public conversation going together. Uh, people tend to defer to the leader. It can be real quiet until, you know, the leader speaks, and then the leader has to call on individual people. That's just the way it is in Asia. So to change that takes some time if you want to have a real interactive uh, uh, conversation. In the U.S., people blurt out things all over the place. Everyone knows that. No one can keep their mouth shut. So it maybe you need to control the chaos, keep it, keep it down. In Europe, it's kind of a, a blend. They tend to be a little bit more thoughtful in meetings than we are here in the Americas. Uh, so there are important cultural differences underneath the hood. And I mean the private styles we were talking about, people tend to be the same worldwide. It's a, it's a deeper uh, level of thinking that is less subject to cultural influence. Now, that's interesting because one of our viewers who is an expert in working with Asia PAC companies has made the point that uh, uh, we tend to make decisions based on transactional, in a transactional way. In Asia, they tend to make decisions in a consensual way and on a consensus basis. Um, so there are some nuances there. And uh, you're, um, as you just said, you take that into account? Oh, yeah, Absolutely. Yeah, you have to, in Asia, if you want a decision to be implemented, it certainly needs to be, there needs to be a big consensus compared to what happens here in the Americas. Uh, nonetheless, uh, most of the Asian experiences I've had, you know, it's a fairly hierarchical organized culture that we're going to be looking at. So consequently, the people who are most senior are going to make the final decision. Now, they may have floated a decision a lot of different ways, but the decision will need to be made ultimately by the key leaders. And hopefully they will be aware that they need to make a decision that is going to have broad acceptance throughout the organization. That takes time. So compared to here in the U S these decisions are going to be taken at, at a slower pace than here. Yeah, that's a great comment. You know, and based on we've now been doing these kind of sessions, as you both know, for over 10 weeks. We went day two of the shutdown, we went virtual. And uh, so we've been really watching this carefully in terms of decision making and productivity. And we've had some CEOs say, well, our productivity went up. And our question back to them was, are you so sure about that? Are you really looking at it closely? Because just to your point, while we may seem, seem to have an agreement, it may not be universal. Um, there's another question that came up too, uh, and from one of our viewers, uh, that's uh, one of our advisors, uh, would you, when you talk about a phone call versus a Zoom call in a one-on-one -on -one conversation, uh, what are the pros and cons there? Phone call versus a Zoom call in terms of a one-on-one -on -one conversation. What, what's your perspective there? Well, at this point in time, um, telephone calls are easier to make. You pick up the phone, you call, you send an email and say, I'm going to call you at two o'clock or something like that. And that's, you know, that's, that's easy to organize. But I think these are early days in this new virtual world we're living in here. And I think we're going to all see the, a lot of more comfort at organizing video calls. And I know that I'm using this technology a lot more to deal with people I've dealt with for years because I can see their faces. I do get not necessarily the same kind of interaction I would have if I'm sitting across the table from them, but I can at least see their face and see what's going on. Yeah, but one of the things we recommend to folks who are doing a lot of Zoom meetings, we did talk about Zoom fatigue, is that to toggle back and forth between phone calls and Zoom, Zoom meetings. And at, at times, even when doing Zoom meetings, uh, disable their own video so they, they don't see pictures of themselves, but they see pictures of other people. Just uh, 
helps with being distracted because we tend to focus our own uh, picture rather than kind of tune in to, to the visual views of other people. Good point, Armin. Yeah. Now, these are early days. We've all got a lot to learn about this virtual new world we're living in. Yeah, Just, and another question that came up from our viewer that I think is really very pertinent here, uh, and that is in the area of performance management. Uh, we, we, we haven't seen performance management systems and feedback roll out quite yet virtually, although some companies have been doing it for a while. But what would you recommend to team members uh, in terms of giving each other feedback um, so they can help support each other and coach each other in terms of performance improvement? Um, are there some techniques there that they can leverage now that we're in a, this virtual environment? Well, feedback, whether it's virtual or face-to-face, -face, is not easy. You know, a lot of people simply won't do it because they're afraid of offending others. So it's going to take skill, knowing how to be honest and, and, and candid with people without offending them. And I'm not sure that the skills are all that much different. I think the virtual environment makes it a bit more difficult to do that. But basically, you have to understand if you're giving feedback to someone, chances are you're really not criticizing that person as a person. It's not a matter of character. It's a matter of what's working well and what isn't working well. And oftentimes, people get choked up about giving feedback because they think they're actually criticizing some person's character, when in fact, it really has nothing whatever to do with that. And that realization makes the feedback a lot easier, whether it's virtual or face to face. Yeah, focusing on the situation and the behavior itself or the specific action and then, and then sure. the impact that it's having on the individual or the team. Uh, so kind of making it very clear that that behavior is um, having both a positive and a negative impact. I mean, feedback, when we hear feedback, we always think of something that's negative, but uh, uh, we, we emphasize, we know from research on employee engagement that praise and rec recognition really enhances employee engagement. So we also recommend to give each other positive praise, and, but make it specific on the behavior rather than it being general. Great point. Yeah, that's a great point. Uh, one, one final question as we move to a close here. Um, one of our viewers is asking about the four block decision making uh, plan you have, the four block decision making types. Where does a non detail C level exec fit in? Well, I tend to be uh, in the decisive or flexible category. Question is the distinction there is if you have a, a C level executive who's decisive that person is not going to want to get into a lot of detail. Neither will someone in the flexible category. The difference is, is that a decisive executive is going to make a decision and stick with it and stay the course. Someone who's flexible could just quickly go off in a different direction. So the research we've done, that Harvard Business Review article, I would encourage people to uh, pick up a copy and look at that, shows that as people climb the ladder up to the C-suite, most of them – First, they will be decisive or flexible at time, but they're mostly going to be analytic. They'll be either integrative or hierarchic because they're making bigger decisions, broader decisions, more complex decisions, and that requires more thinking. Okay. Well, again, that's a uh, great feedback. Again, uh, for our, uh, our viewers, thank you for participating today. On the screen there, again, you can see uh, where you can go for this complimentary assessment. We encourage you to do that. Uh, there'll also be a recording of this session up on the ENP TV site um, shortly. And Armin, if you'll turn the screen back over to me, I'll give them the link for that uh, ENP TV again. And then finally, um, again, to both of you, uh, fantastic job, terrific job. Uh, I know these folks are going to want to contact you. So for again, for everyone that's on this um, uh, viewing today, we will be uh, sending out a um, we will be sending you a uh, uh, link to this recording and to how to contact. Again, this is where you can reach us on our next uh, sessions. Again, John Rossman is on May 26th. That's at 11 a.m. And again, this session will be on the ENP TV channel uh, as of Tuesday of next week. And you'll also be getting an email from us with the contact information for Armin and Ken. Again, Armin, Ken, thanks. Uh, enjoy the Memorial Weekend. Uh, 
uh, stay safe, stay healthy, and I'm sure we'll be coming back to you uh, because this virtual environment is not going away, obviously. Uh, in fact, it's just, just increasing. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Scott. Thank you, everyone. Thanks again. Right. Great seeing you. Bye-bye.